I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 is where we're going to be today as we continue our Just Jesus series, uh, looking at the Gospel of Luke for uh, an entire year, looking at Jesus and what he teaches and how he lives and the encounters that he has. Uh, and if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats. They look like this one. Turn to page 1098 and you will find Luke chapter 7. It's page 1098. And uh, if uh, you need a Bible, you want to read God's Word, you don't have a Bible, then feel free to take one of these with you. We want you to have God's Word to read it because we know if you do that, it will change your life. Hey, speaking of uh, life-changing encounters with Scripture, let me give you a, a couple of opportunities to really grow your faith, grow your knowledge, uh, challenge you. If you've been hungering to, to learn more, to study more, to, to you know, kind of shake up your faith and get yourself in a place where you're learning a whole lot more and a whole lot more intensely, the Word of God. First one is this. Uh, whether you know this or not, we host a class uh, every quarter now from uh, Gateway Seminary. A and uh, we host it at our McCulloch campus. And it's going to be starting up in September. And this September, we're going to be uh, offering up the Introduction to the New Testament Part 1. And it's a seminary level class, master's level class. But if you really want to take on that challenge, you want to study the New Testament, learn it at a level deeper than anything you've uh, faced before, then I just want to invite you to check that out. You can get some information about the class after the, the service out at the main lobby connection center uh, or talk to Pastor Chet, email Pastor Chet. Information's in your bulletin about that. But it, it, uh, the teacher is Dr. David Johnson. He's a friend of mine, and I highly recommend him. He is a very excellent teacher, and you will benefit greatly if that's something that God leads you to do. Second opportunity is a year and a half away, and that is in November of 2017, we're planning a trip to the Holy Land. We're going to go and see the places that the Bible talks about. We're going to walk where Jesus walked. We're going to, you know, uh, sail where Jesus walked because we'll be on the Sea of Galilee and places like that. And if that's something that you want to do, something that you want to bring the Bible alive, then uh, check that out. The information's in your bulletin as well. And I'm mentioning it a year and a half in advance so you can start making plans because it's not an inexpensive excursion to do that and to experience that. But it might be something that you want to do to really bring the Bible alive to you. Now that said, let me switch gears and dive into our message today. Do you guys, uh, who likes power? Who, who likes to have power? Uh, so there's not a lot of hands that went up, but you're not thinking the way that I'm thinking because um, air conditioning functions on power, right? Internet functions on power. So who likes power now? Yeah. Everybody, we live in Havasu. Without power, we're in trouble, you know, or we're all in the lake, you know. Oh, well, forget that. But see, some of you like power in your boat. I confess, I like power in my car, okay? I tried, I really tried to convince myself that I could be happy with a four-cylinder. Just couldn't do it. Well, I guess I could have done it, but I didn't want to, all right? Because when I step on the gas, I want the car to move. I like that feel of power, well, today we're starting an emphasis on power. We're going to be looking at God's power as evidenced in Jesus' life and his encounters uh, over this next few weeks. And so today we start off with the centurion story in Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Now, a centurion, in case you're wondering, is a Roman military commander and uh, obviously, because of the name, he's a commander over 100 men. That's where we get the word century from and, and all that kind of stuff. So he's a commander over 100 men. This is his story. That's all we know about him personally. Uh, uh, we don't have a name or anything like that. Luke 7, verse 1. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, Jesus entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death who was highly valued by him. And when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. 
When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Now, just a little bit of background. This is early in Jesus' ministry, but people already know that he can heal. He's been working miracles. With the crowds, they've been bringing the sick to him, the, the people who are demon-possessed, so they know he has power. And, and Capernaum is the, the seat of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. It's kind of his home base. I know, we all know Jesus is from Nazareth. He was raised in Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth. But uh, Capernaum is right on the Sea of Galilee. It's right there in the midst of a lot of uh, economy and commerce and things like that. Nazareth was, uh, uh, well, it's a short drive away, but if you're walking, it's not really close. And, and, uh, and so that's the place where Jesus kind of started his ministry at. And the story begins by the centurion making a request. Come and heal my servant. Now, obviously, the centurion valued his servant. He's a man of compassion. Uh, the, you know, he cares about this guy who works for him. The Jewish elders, they were respected men of the synagogue, came to Jesus on his behalf. And they said, Jesus, this man is a generous man. He loves our nation. He loves our people. He built us our synagogue. Uh, that's pretty much uh, uh, an investment in the community. He probably was uh, what uh, scholars call a God-fearer. In other words, he was a, a person who wasn't Jewish, but he had come to believe in the Jewish God. He came to recognize that all the gods of the Romans and the Greeks weren't real, but the God that the Jews worshipped was the one true living God. Didn't convert to Judaism, but he learned from it. He read the scriptures. He would go to synagogue, those kinds of things. And, and so, uh, first of all, he made this request, come and heal my servant. And then we see in the centurion respect. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. I'm not worthy. Now, two statements about his respect. First of all, he doesn't believe that he deserves the blessing. He's grateful that Jesus is coming to his house. And, and he says, look, I'm not worthy. He's not entitled. He, he just goes, I don't deserve this blessing that you're coming. And so he sent people and said, you don't need to come into my house because I'm a sinner. And, and then secondly, he recognizes Jesus' authority and power. Now, this is where he's really showing his respect because he says, look, I understand you have authority, you have power. I'm a commander. I have authority. I have power. I say to my servants, do this. They do it. I say to my uh, men under my command, go here, and they go here. I get that. So you just say the word, and my servant will be healed. That's respect for Jesus' authority. Um, now, notice in verse 9 what Jesus says when he hears this. He says, I tell you, not even in Israel... Have I found such faith? Israel, the people of God, not even among the people of God, have I found somebody with this kind of faith? This was an ex extreme kind of faith. And Jesus is impressed, and he commends the centurion. And then in the story, we see the result. They found the servant well. Verse 10, you know, Jesus said, okay, you said it, he's, it's done. They go home, and they find the servant healed. So the result is Jesus healed the servant. Jesus demonstrated his power and his authority. That's the centurion's story. And, and uh, you know, maybe like me, you read this along with us and looked at it and kind of went, okay, nice story. We get to see Jesus' power. Uh, what does that have to do with me? What do we learn from this encounter? And so let's talk about the challenge. The challenge. Because here's what grabs me about this story. You have a man, a centurion, who doesn't know Jesus. He knows about Jesus. He's heard stories. He's, people have testified, have told him who, who he is, what he can do. He's just heard about Jesus. 
but he doesn't know him personally. And he still, he made the request. He demonstrated the respect. And then he trusted Jesus with the results. So think about this. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you have a life-changing relationship with the Son of God. You know Jesus personally. He, He has changed your life. He's forgiven your sins. You've confessed him as Savior. That means that most of us in this room are the people of God. And just as Jesus kind of commended the the centurion saying, you know, among the people of God, I haven't seen such faith. I want to use his faith to challenge ours. And I want to ask three questions that I think the centurion could ask us based on what we see in his his life, in his example. And I'll let them challenge you in relationship to God's power. First question is this. Do we believe that God has the power to change lives? Do we believe that God has the power to redeem the broken? Do we believe that God has the power to heal our bodies or reconcile our marriages or or redeem our families? Do you believe that God has the power to forgive all your sins and to set you free? Do you believe that God has the power See, the centurion believed. It's obvious he believed. We know he believed because he asked. He said, Jesus, will you come and heal my servant? Do something that nobody else can do. My doctors can't do it. We haven't been able to do it. The healers haven't been able to do it. We're at a desperate place. We need you to do this because nobody else can. So what do your requests of God say about your belief in God's power? What are you asking God to do in your life? Is it little things? Is it things that you ask for but you don't really expect? You're just kind of like, well, I kind of hope something happens. Do you kind of treat your requests of God, your prayers, like a lottery ticket? I'll buy it. I don't really expect much, but I've got it in case something happens. You see, the question is, do we really believe that God has the power to do something miraculous in our lives. Honestly, one reason that that I personally believe so many churches and Christians live powerless lives is because somewhere in our journey, we stopped believing that God has the power. We stopped believing that God really can change people, that God really can redeem our brokenness. Here's what it looks like in a church. People stop believing that God can really change any life, forgive anyone, redeem us from any brokenness. Now, they don't confess that. They just start living it. You ask them, you go to any church in this, in this country, and you walk in, you say, hey, do you believe God has the power to change lives? And people go, yeah, I do. Why? Well, because God changed me. But, but then a lot of times people just kind of stop right there. God changed me, but I really don't know that he can change my neighbor I really don't know that he can change my friend. He really can't change those degenerate people down the street that are a mess. Now, if they really live out their lives, they don't believe that God will change anyone. You know how you see it? Because they don't ever invite anyone to experience the life-changing power of God. They don't desperately try to get their family or their friends or their, you know, neighbors that are really broken, to come and and experience that life-changing power of God because their church is for them and they go, and but it's not really for people to experience God. And they live joyless, hopeless lives that honestly don't attract anybody to the gospel of Jesus. So let me be really clear. At Calvary, we know that God has the power to change lives. We know that God has the power to redeem the broken and heal the hurting. Why do we know that? Because we have seen God do that in our lives and in the lives of our friends all around us. 
I mean, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but this church, including many of the leaders, is filled with failures that God has radically changed. I mean, we've got leaders that are addicts and drug dealers and drunks that have been set free. We, we've got people who, who have experienced broken marriages and families that have been restored or redeemed. We have, you know, people who are hopeless and suicidal that now live life with joy and purpose. You see, we're that church filled with people who are never going to go to church, right? How many of you, that's your story. How many of you are the last person in the world that was ever going to show up in church? Yeah, go ahead and confess. Raise your hand. See, there's lots of hands going up around you. You guys aren't nearly as proud of it as 8 o'clock was, man. You would think that, you know, they would be the ones a little more hesitant because they're the ones who grew up in traditional church. But, but the reality is that, that this church is filled with people that were hopeless. Then people went, oh, they'll never come to Christ. They'll never experience that life-changing power of God. But we know differently. And because we see it, that's why we're going to tell our stories. That's confession, by the way. Telling what God has done, telling how broken you were, explaining how he changed your life. The letter to James says, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. See, we're going to confess because we're not ashamed of our past. The truth is, that's why we're truth, that's why we're honest, that's why we're transparent here, because we're not ashamed of our past, because our past demonstrates God's power to redeem and to change lives. We're celebrating his power, and the only way you celebrate his power is by explaining what he's done in your life. By the way, if you're visiting with us or checking us out or, or, you know, you're new to Calvary, that's why we're not afraid of your sin. Because there are people in leadership here that were far more messed up than you've ever been. That's just reality. And, and, and so you're not the worst sinner that we're going to meet. You're not the worst sinner that we know. And, and we're not afraid of your sin because we know that God has the power to redeem and so we're going to continue to celebrate with every single baptism. And we're going to rejoice with every single person who steps into recovery. And we're going to celebrate every marriage that improves. And we're going to be thankful for every second chance that God gives. Because we believe that God has the power. I believe that God has the power to change lives. Do you? Do you? Okay, well, some of you do. That's good because, uh, you know, we have to be sure about that because if we're not, we'll live like it. So the first challenge is do we believe that God has the power? The second challenge from the centurion is this. Do we respect God's authority? Do we respect God's authority? The centurion respected Jesus' authority, and he demonstrated it in his attitude and his actions. Hold that thought for a moment. Tomorrow is the 4th of July. Do you guys enjoy the 4th of July as a holiday? I mean, yeah, some of you are excited about it. I mean, it's, it's just a great holiday. Is it? You know why I like the 4th of July? Because you don't have to buy anybody presents. <laughs> it is awesome, right? It's a holiday, and they celebrate it on the day. You know, it's not like, oh, we're just going to kick it to whatever Monday is close. You get to celebrate it on the day. You don't have to buy any presents, and there's a lot of food involved, and it's food I like. You know, it's burgers, it's ice cream, it's good. So, 4th of July. Tomorrow's 4th of July. We're going to celebrate. We're going to have a great patriotic celebration service at 9 o'clock. It's going to be awesome. And, uh, and, and so let me ask you this. How many of you here, since tomorrow's our national holiday, Independence Day, how many of you respect the flag? Okay. Lots of hands went up. i got to remember that question because that's like the first time every hand in the room went up. <laughs> Even though, it, you know, most of the time we're supposed to answer the question. We're like, yeah, I'm not going to raise my hand. I don't care. So we respect the flag. So if you saw somebody who was completely disrespecting the flag. I mean, you saw somebody take the American flag and throw it on the ground and start trampling on it. How many of you would be upset at that? Okay. Let's go back to the story. The centurion respected Jesus' authority, and he demonstrated it in his actions and his attitude. First, his attitude. He said, hey, look, I'm not worthy, Jesus. You, you don't have to come here. He knew that, that Jesus was holy, and he was a sinner, and he said... Uh, I'm not worthy. He's just grateful that Jesus was willing to help him. So how is your attitude toward God? 
do you see yourself as unworthy or do you think that you're entitled? Are you grateful for the blessings that God has given or are you complaining that God hasn't given you more? You see, the attitude of respect recognizes that God doesn't owe us anything. That even life itself, in whatever capacity we have it or however long we have it, is a gift from God and we don't deserve it. It is a blessing for us. And it recognizes that every single good thing in your life comes from God. And so we're grateful. The attitude of disrespect believes that God owes them. Think about the centurion. He was a prominent man, a powerful man. He was a generous man. He'd done all this stuff. He could have said, hey, you should come to my house and you should heal my servant because I'm important in this community. I'm significant. I've got a, a group of men that will do whatever I tell them to. And if you don't come and heal my servant, then I'll trash this town. I'll go to Nazareth and I'll burn your family's house down. See, he had that kind of authority, but he didn't step into it. He didn't try to demand he didn't believe he was entitled to it. But the attitude of disrespect, God owes me more blessings. He owes me more health. He owes me more money. He owes me more comfort. It's not enough. So how's your attitude toward God? And then our actions demonstrate respect. The centurion sent servants and said, hey, you don't have to come here. I'm under authority, and you're a man of authority. You just say the word, and it'll be done. I'll submit to your authority. So are your actions submissive to God, or are you defying him? Do you willingly embrace the role of God's servant, or is your focus on taking care of yourself? I'm going to hit below the belt here just for a minute, so go ahead and brace yourself. We, across the board, we respect the flag of the United States of America, and we should. And I'm sure that if I had you stand up right now and say the Pledge of Allegiance, you would do that, and, and, uh, and rightfully so. And you would be upset if somebody was disrespecting the flag of our nation. But Jesus says to us, his followers, love one another as I have loved you. Love your neighbor as yourself. And yet most of the time we live our lives focused on our needs and our wants and what we're going to do and we ignore the people around us at best or we're rude to them at worst because they're in the way and they're not doing what we want them to do. The Apostle Paul described love uh, this way. Love is patient. Love is kind. There's more to it, but let's just stop right there. Are you being patient and kind with your family? When you're out on the boat, when it's hot, when you're tired, when they're not doing what you want them to do? Or do we ignore Jesus' commands and disrespect his authority? We pray the Lord's Prayer that he taught us to pray, and we include this line in it, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive. Forgive. We know that Jesus wants us to forgive as he has forgiven us. And yet we hold on to these grudges and this anger and this bitterness inside of us. And we speak lies and slander about those who have hurt us. And we wait and we actually pray for their demise that we might gloat in their pain. And in doing that, we disrespect our Lord. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. And, and if I've served you, then you should serve one another. And yet we're too busy to serve the living God, even though he allows us the privilege of stepping into that place. But we've got things to do and places to go, and we're busy. And, you know, God, you know even though you gave me every day that I have, I'm not going to give any of it back to you. And so we come here on Sunday morning, and we pledge allegiance to our God in songs and in service but do we walk out the door and trample his flag? Do we respect God's authority? Does your attitude and actions demonstrate a respect for the authority of Jesus in your life? The centurion challenges us 
Do we believe that God has the power? Do we respect God's authority? And the third challenge, do we trust God with the results? The centurion requested Jesus to heal his servant, and Jesus said, yes. But the centurion trusted Jesus with the results. He sent his servants to him and just said, you say the word and it'll be done. I, I trust you. So let me ask you this. When we ask God to heal, when we ask God to redeem our lives, when we ask God to work miracles, are we trusting God with the results? Because this is the hard part, because a lot of times we're praying and we're saying, God, we want you to do this. And what we have in our minds is, God, I want you to work this way, and I want you to work this time, and here's how I want it to be. And, and, and we've got our schedule all laid out for God to work the way that we want God to work. So we ask for healing. Maybe it's for ourselves. Maybe we're ill. Maybe it's for a loved one that we care about. And sometimes God heals. And when God heals, we celebrate, don't we? We start talking about how great God is and how wonderful he is and, and praising God, and rightfully so. But what about when God doesn't heal? Maybe your loved one has cancer and you pray for them to get better and instead they get worse. Maybe you're living with chronic pain or some kind of chronic condition that just... You, takes the joy out of life because life hurts and it's a struggle and you pray that God would make you well so you could serve him and he doesn't. Or maybe you've got someone that you love that is, that, that's dying and you pray God restore them to life and they die. Are you still trusting God with the results? So here's just some reality, some perspective when God doesn't heal the way that we want him to, it doesn't mean that he's uncaring. It doesn't mean that he's punishing you, that you weren't good enough. It doesn't mean that you're at fault. It doesn't mean that you're faithless. If you really get right down to it, it just honestly means that God was being merciful to the person who was suffering. Now think about this because this is hard. As followers of Jesus, this world is going to be filled with pain. We know that because this world is broken, it's filled with sin, and sin leads to death. And on the way to death, there's pain involved. Jesus told us we'd have pain. He said, hey, I've told you all these things so that in me you can have peace. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. That's not <laughs> a fun thing, by the way. But don't worry, I've, take, I, I've overcome the world. So you're going to have this pain in the world. That's a reality. But as followers of Jesus, what happens when we die? Okay, we go to heaven. We get new bodies. Anybody excited about that? Yeah, there's some of you that will like yourselves for the very first time ever in heaven. You're going to become the perfect you the you that you were created to be. And here's the promise that the Apostle John mentions in Revelation. The old order of things is done away with. All things become new, and there's no more suffering or sorrow or death or pain. So a lot of times when we're praying for our loved ones, we're asking God to deprive them of paradise for a season. You think about that? We're asking God, God, I don't want them to go to paradise yet. I don't want them to be perfect yet. I want to keep them here. It, there's a lot of selfishness in that. Let's just be honest about it. By the way, just have to point this out. The centurion's servant that was healed by Jesus, he's dead. Yeah, it'd be kind of creepy if he was still walking around, wouldn't it? 2,000 years later, looks really old and worn out. no. And all those people that Jesus healed, they died. Even the people he raised from the dead, they died again. That sucked. Uh, and, uh, and none of us want to do it once, and they got to do it twice. I mean, come on. Where's the fairness in that? I know that's an obvious statement, but we need to kind of really boil it down to the question of do we trust God when we don't like the results 
when we don't understand the why, when he doesn't do what we ask, are we still going to trust him? My story is this. My dad died 19 years ago. He was out on the lake with me. Uh, we took a bunch of underprivileged kids out on boats that had never been on a boat before, and we were having a great time. When he had a heart attack, and, and I, I got him to the marina, and he was still engaged and talking, uh, and the paramedics got there and thought everything was going to be fine, and they load him up in the ambulance, and I'm riding in the back of a fire truck on the way to the hospital, and God and I are having this conversation. God, I want you to heal my dad. I, I want you to make him well. I want you to make him whole. I want him to, to be healthy. I don't want him to die. I, don't, I want him to make it. But I had to include this last line. Not my will, but your will be done. You see, I was one of the, the people designated as my dad's medical power of attorney, so I knew exactly what he, his requests were, what his um, desires were if he were not uh, able to, to function without machines and all that kind of stuff. And I got to the hospital, and they said, he didn't make it, but we've got him alive on a machine. What do, you, what do we have to do? And I had to tell him to unplug it. See, God didn't give me what I asked for. But I still believe that God has the power to heal. He just healed my dad forever. And, and, and my dad's out of pain, and he's out of the struggle. And here's the thing. I trust God with the result. We're asking God to redeem our lives. We're asking God to heal our marriages, reconcile our families, provide for our needs, save our kids. The truth is, we need miracles in our life. So today, I'm going to challenge you. Will you honestly pray, God, I'll do whatever it takes for you to change me, for you to redeem my life, my marriage, my family. I'll submit to your authority, your power. I'm going to respect you as best that I can, and I'm going to trust you with the results, but you do whatever it takes to work that miracle in my life. Because if you invite God to do whatever it takes, and you're willing to trust him with the results, he, he will do things that you don't really want him to do right now, but he will work miracles in your life and change you like never before. So will you trust God with the results, even if you don't like them? God has the power to change our lives. I pray today that you really believe that, and you decide to trust God. Let's pray.